I've come to free the words. Come to free thee. Words come to free. Words come to to free the words. Come to free the words. Come to thee free words. Come to words, the free. Come to free words, thee. Come to the words free. Come to words free thee. To free the words come. To free words thee come. To free words come thee. To free come words thee. To free words come thee. To free come the words. Words come to free thee. Words come free to thee. Words come to thee free too. Words come to the free. Words come free thee too. Words come thee to free. Come, the words too free. Come, the two words free. Come thee, free to words. Come, the words free too. Come, the two free words. Come, the free words too. Words, thee come to free. Words, thee too come free. Words, the free to come. Words, thee come free too. Words, thee too come free. Words, thee free come too.
in um, the early 60s, when um, I went to England, invited by the BBC to, to they gave me a program, first of all, and then I met some producer there, Douglas Cleverett, and he said that they were, they, were, they were expecting new, bigger machines. You realize that in those days, an eight-track machine was considered enormous, and they were going to get a 32 one. Uh, so it wasn't if I would like to come over and play with it and leave it arranged for I'd have it for a whole week. And so I went over and I had all the technicians who produce haunted house footsteps, you know, what's called footsteps in movies, all haunted house noises or anything else like that. And we, then it turned out that they couldn't give me the whole week and we stopped the experiment just when it was beginning to get very interesting, was that a pre graph and a, a prepared text when cut up and cut up and cut up and cut up became more and more unintelligible to a certain point and therefore presumably less interesting, except that just one step, one cut further than that, it started talking by itself in new words. Like, uh, for example, the, the only thing that I have, I don't have any of that tape. They never, they fixed it so that I couldn't have any of that. I never got a copy of what that thing, the unfinished part of it. The whole thing was sort of quickly sort of rolled up and put in a bag and said, I'm terribly sorry, we can't give you the Thursday and Friday that we promised you, but you know, after all, you had Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. But they were perfectly charming. And there was the possibility, Douglas Cleverton was worried that we were getting off into an area that was too much for him. He was the producer and a very charming person who done whatever was considered far out in those days, like he was a very famous thing, which I think is still given again often as, as uh, Dylan Thomas is under Milk Wood with all kinds of famous people, actors and actresses. Mm -hmm. saying, well, that was the sort of thing that he was very good at. And he was a little bit taken aback. I mean, he was wanting to go all the way with the, with the cut-ups and the, with the permutations, first of all. In fact, he made the uh, yam, 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 and all of those things were made with him, and the pistol poem was made with him. You've heard those? You know those? You've never heard yam, 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 yam? I guess we're going to have to do this, yeah. 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 Uh-huh. Well, it was just that we, we, came to a, we came to a stop where, and then he, as I said, he said, I said, you know, may I have that? And so, well, no, I'm sorry, it's gone in the dustbin sort of thing, which was, you know, reason for a bit of paranoia because it could just as easily have been given to me. But I saw then and there that, that one could, could force voices out of voice material which would say new texts and new words and presumably new messages. I am that I am. I am that I am I. Am that. I am. I am. That I am. I am that I am. I am that am I. Am I that I am. Am I I that am? I that I am am. Am that I? Am I? That I am I am. That am I I am. That I am. Am I? That I I am am. That am I? Am I? I that am am I. I, I that am, am, I am I, am that, I am, am I that, am I that, am I that, I am that, I am that, I am, I am I that am, I am, am I that, I am that, am I, I am I, am that, I am, am that, I, am that I am, I, am that, am I, I, am that I, I am, am that, I am, am that, am I, I, and that, and that I am I am I that I am I am 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 that I am I am
I not? I am. Am I I that am? I that I am, am. Am that I, am I? That I am, I am. That am I, I am. That I am, am I? That I, I am, am. That am I, am I? I that am, am I? I, I that am, am. I am I, am that. I am. Am I that? Am I that I am? I am that I am. 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 One, two, three, four, five. One, two, four, three, five. One, two, five, four, three. One, two, three, five, four. One, two, four, five, three. One. Calling all active agents re. Calling all active agents re. Calling all active re agents. Calling all agents reactive. Calling all re agents active. All agents active. Calling all agents reactive. Calling all agents active. Calling all active agents. Calling re all agents active. Calling re agents active. All. Calling re active all agents. Calling all re active agents. Calling active all re agents. Calling agents all re active agents. Calling calling all re active. Calling agents agents. Calling 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 calling. Re all calling active agents. Re all active agents calling. Re all agents active calling. Re all calling active agents. Agents calling all re active. Agents calling re all active. Agents calling active all re. Agents calling all active re agents calling reactive all agents calling active re all reactive agents all calling reactive agents all calling reactive calling agents all recalling all active agents recalling active agents all recalling agents active all Oh, not really. No, no, that isn't censorship. No, no, that isn't what I call censorship. No, 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 that isn't censorship at all. Censorship is something so potent that you wouldn't even write a piece because you knew that it could never get published. That is censorship. And that is the way that is state that all writers were in until 1960. That nobody sat down in front of his typewriter, not anybody, not Henry Miller, nor, nor even people who were... Well, there was very little porn literature about it. It was very specialized, and very few pieces came anybody's way, as a matter of fact. 
but um, since the James Joyce uh, condemnation of Ulysses and, and the fact that all of those books that were published in Paris could not be taken into, into England and all those sort of things, no writer sat down until Ger Maurice Gerodius came along and said, I will give you $600 for whatever you write. You can write whatever you like and I will publish it here in Paris. And that's really where, where it began, it was right there. And the, he, he went down, he, he, he was defeated by his own, uh, well, his own weaknesses in some part, but he was, he was persecuted into the kind of censorship that exists here in, Paris, in France where there are some books that do not appear. Uh, fewer and fewer of them, they might even so, they manage, but there may be one or two writers that have difficulty in getting their works published, maybe getting tighter this month than it was last month rather than the other way around. But the fact is that real censorship is when you know that you're going to be arrested and punished for whatever you're writing, write in your own typewriter so that you do not write it. And that's the way it was, certainly right up until 1960. No, poets don't own words. Poets don't own no words. Don't own no poets' words. Own no words, poets don't. Words, poets don't own, no. Poets don't know own words. Don't know own words, poets. No own words, poets don't. Own words, poets don't know. Words, poets don't know, own. Own words, don't know poets. Words, don't know poets' own. Don't know poets' own words. No poets' own words don't. Poets' own words don't know. Words' own poets don't know. Own poets don't know words. Poets don't know words' own. Don't know words' own poets. No words on, poets don't. Well, uh, it is an acquaintance rather than a friendship, but it's a very long acquaintance. I found Jean Genet again uh, in Paris in 1949 when I came back from America and uh, reminded him that we had met in the 1930s. He at first denied it until I asked him if he didn't remember a boy who had the word fatalitas tied or, uh, <laughs> tattooed around his neck. And then, because he had first said, no, no, we couldn't have met because I was in jail during all of those years that you mentioned. And then when I reminded him of fatalitas, he remembered that at one time he'd been free for a matter of weeks or months or days, I don't know what. And uh, I then didn't see very much of him, only very occasionally during those years because I went back to Morocco in 19, I went to Morocco in 1950 and it was actually in Morocco that I saw him again in 1969 and uh, at that time uh, we saw rather more of each other walking around Tangier and spending some long afternoons together talking and uh, he pointed out a Moroccan whom I had known by sight for a long time and had rather avoided because he always carried books under his arm. And I avoided Moroccans with books under their arms. <laughs> None of my friends could read or write, either in Arabic or anything else. And uh, I knew that this was the brand of rather sort of troublesome student. And Jeanne said to me, oh, I must go and talk to him because I gave him a wrong piece of information. He asked me, the meaning of the red and the black as in the title of the Stendhal book and uh, whatever it was that I told him I now feel that I had given him the wrong answer. So that's how we met Mohammed Shukri. Uh, uh, that day I met him for the very first time and I don't know if you've read it but there's a very amusing little book called Jean Genet in Tangier written by Shukri and uh, translated by Paul Bowles. Most of the action in this little book occurs at Brian Geisen's house and that was because very shortly after that, in the month of July, I had a motorcycle accident and lost some toes and uh, was in a cast at home. But when I started getting out a little bit, I ran into Genet again at the Café de France. He was living in the uh, Minza Hotel, the most expensive hotel in the city, and very proud to be able to do so. 
uh, and to impose upon them his, uh, um, let's say, um, his uncouth ways and uh, his uh, not very clean clothes. Uh, he was rather proud of the fact that he hadn't changed his clothes since he'd last seen William Burroughs at the Chicago Democratic Convention of 1968. And this was the summer of 1969, and he was still wearing the same shirt and the same jacket and the same pants, and uh, said that uh, he was rich enough to force a, uh, an establishment like the Hotel Minza to accept him because he was both rich and famous. Um, I, at that time, uh, he, we had a long discussion about just how famous he was. It seemed to worry him rather considerably uh, as to whether this fame would last. And we were sitting one day on the terrace of the Café de Paris again, and uh, he said, uh, well, you know, after all, nobody will read what I wrote a hundred years from now, will they? And I said, well, they might very well. I don't think that the French language is going to change that much. That was always this very sore subject between us about language and the use of language and his very conservative use of the French language, which he says he respects more than any other living writer. Um, this has brought about his present position where a uh, magazine, Nouvelle Littéraire, came out with a, a special issue about Jean Genet saying that he probably was the greatest French writer. So I said, yes, certainly you'll be r around for 100 years. And he said, do you think 200 years? And I said, well, maybe even 200 years. He said, well, not 1,000 years. Well, and I said, well, no, who can say what's going to happen 1,000 years from now? But you can see that this preoccupied him very much. And uh, seeing me in, the, in my plaster, and at that time I had a very handsome apartment, a penthouse that overlooked all of northern Morocco. I could see from... Uh, on the right-hand side, the Atlantic and the Caves of Hercules, right across the Rift Mountains and down towards Gibraltar, all of which I could see from my terrace. And uh, he said, I think you're very lonely here. Well, I wasn't lonely there at all. I was, I was surrounded by a group of people and a number of Moroccan friends of very long standing who were looking after me rather tenderly, in fact. But he said, I think you're very lonely, so I have decided that I will stay on in Tangier and I will come every day and spend the afternoon with you. And I said, well, that's absolutely delightful. I would be more than happy to have you to lunch every day. We have lunch here in my house at sort of Moroccan hours, which is 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And, oh, he couldn't wait for lunch that long. He had to have his lunch at 12.30. So he said, no, no, what I will do is I will have my lunch at the hotel, and then I will come here for mint tea afterwards. Well, the real reason that he felt that I was... Uh, worth visiting was because he actually found my Moroccan friends very fascinating. He speaks uh, reasonably good uh, Maghrebi, that is the dialect of North Africa. He had lived in, in uh, rather he'd, he said he hadn't lived at all, he'd just been a captive of the army and had actually deserted from the French colonial forces during the time that he had been stationed in the south of Morocco when he had started to learn Arabic at that time. And he'd continued it through the years, and he found spending the afternoon with me was an excellent occasion to practice his Arabic. So that uh, we saw each other rather more intimately, and, and as I say, every day for a month. Uh, a good deal of the conversation was in Arabic, but it was also between the two of us in French. And um, at my house at that time, uh, somebody was stealing. And so I said, look, Jean, you are the, the great uh, authority on theft. Who do you think of those present is the one who is managing to steal quite regularly in this house? Uh, it turned out that it was a, a black Moroccan friend of mine. And that was, he said, oh, he's the only one who couldn't possibly have been stealing it. <laughs> Whether this was his, his, his prejudice for, for the panther type, I don't know. But he uh, was always, to them, and in Arabic, uh, calling himself a kelb, a dog. And uh, he was a little bit shocked when they picked it up and, and, and in fact, referred to him as the dog. I don't think that he, he meant the game to be played quite that way. But he was always saying, I am a, a thief, a pederast, a, um, a deserter, a traitor. And um, about at that same time, uh, through another friend of mine, a writer, Sanche de Camon, 
uh, I had become friendly again with the Clodels. Henri Claudel is married to a Greek lady whom I had known when I was 18 or 19, and I hadn't ever seen them again because I'm not very fond of those rather conservative circles, but they had been very kind to me when I had my, my motorbike accident and had come to visit me in the hospital bringing their, their chef with them from the French uh, uh, embassy as it had been, now just a legation. And, um, Brought, had food sent. I was to ask the chef for anything that I wanted, and they had sent food to the hospital. And when they found out that Jean Genet was coming to my house every day at lunchtime, they were very keen to invite him to lunch. And he s pretended to be utterly shocked. He said, what? They're going to invite traitors to the Maison de France now? And above all, the son of, of, of Paul Claudel? He said, oh, I think that would be too sh shameful for me to impose myself upon them. So he never did go to lunch at the French embassy. Um, he relationship lasted through that whole summer, and uh, I've really never seen him again so consecutively since. It was just after William Burroughs had first published Naked Lunch, and uh, we had the idea at that time, of, and later even, uh, worked on it for a number of years, the possibility of making a film of Naked Lunch which didn't come to pass, but a number of songs were written by me and by William using his words and very few of mine, but my, my choice of words out of Naked Lunch to provide a series of songs for the screenplay. And uh, one of the first was Dead Weight, which in, very much in his words, very few of mine in here, uh, runs Dead Weight, Dead Weight. Dead weight in the dear old days, hanging thick in the air like the smoke from a riverboat. Boys walk down the midway, eating pink sugar floss candy. Jerk off in the Ferris wheel, spreading sperm at the moon, rising real red and smoky over the railroad yards. When the train passes by with a hoot, they've all turned into slobs. They all have fat bellies and responsible jobs. Dead weight, dead weight. This was one of the funnier songs for Naked Lunch. It was meant to be, uh, if you remember at all, or who does, it's a long time ago, the great Dr. Benway performs in human operations, assisted by Violet, a chimpanzee dressed as a, as a nurse, who is the only woman in his life. And as this horrendous operation has, as played by the group here, as a matter of fact, Honey Hoffman, Set this, used this uh, two years ago in one of her theater uh, presentations. Um, so imperceptibly, Violet uh, turns into, from a nurse, she turns into a kind of a diseuse, a sort of sub Marlin Dietrich of the 1920s, and she sings, Oh, I'm a baboon. A blue ass baboon. A high class baboon. What a hell of a hollow blue baboon. Love a baboon who bays at the moon in the mad month of June, the looniest month of them all, 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 one and all. He asked me to spoon in the moonlit lagoon, and there very soon I fall in a swoon from midnight to noon, and I fall, I fall, I fall, because I'm a baboon, a baby baboon, the weakest baboon of them all, 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 one and all. A skinny baboon. A mini baboon, just so tall. But I'm a neurotic, highly erotic, elitist baboon. The effetist baboon, the neatest baboon, the sleekest baboon, the chicest baboon of them all, 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 one and all. I fall in a swoon in the arms of this goon, and there on the dune, from midnight till noon, a, a turning, I give him my all, 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 because I'm a baboon. You can feed with a spoon, the meekest baboon of them all, 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 one and all. I'm a baboon, won't join your platoon. Because I'm not uptight, and they're ready to fight, not at all, at all, at all. I'll take your attack, lying flat on my back, or bracing myself on a wall. Because <laughs> I'm the cheapest baboon of them all, <laughs> one and all. I wouldn't like to think that this is any trouble for
write these names. <laughs> and uh, I found um, graffiti left over probably from some student demonstration in Paris that said, ne travaillons plus. And I thought, well, that's a very good idea. Let's not work anymore at all. And I realized that this, like the things I had done much earlier, this can also be uh, permutated very well. And so I wrote, I don't work today. Don't work today, guy. Work you dig, I don't. You dig, I don't work. Dig, I don't work you. I don't work, dig you. Don't work, dig you, I. Work, dig you, I don't. You, I don't work, dig. Dig you, I don't work. I don't, you dig, work. <laughs> don't you dig work? <laughs> Ooh, work, I don't, you dig. You dig work, I don't. <laughs> it work. I don't. I don't work. Dig. Don't you work? Dig. I work. Dig. I don't. You you work. Dig. I don't. Dig. I don't. <laughs> I don't dig work. You don't dig work. You I work. You I don't dig. You I don't dig work. Dig work. You I don't. I don't dig you work, don't dig you work, I work, I don't dig you, you work, I don't dig, dig you, work, I don't. <laughs> kick that habit, man. Kick that habit. Man, kick that. Habit man, kick. That habit man. Kick that habit man. Kick habit that man. Kick man, habit that. Kick that man, habit. Kick habit, man. That. Kick man, that habit. That habit, kick man. That kick, habit man. That man, habit kick. That habit man, kick. That kick man, habit. That man, kick habit. Habit man, kick that. Habit, kick that man. Habit, that man kick. Habit man, that kick. Have it kick, man, that. Have it that kick, man. Man, kick that habit. Man, that habit kick. Man, have it kick that. Man, kick, have it that. Man, that kick habit. Man, have it that kick. Junk is no good, baby. Junk is no good. Baby, junk is no no good, baby junk. Is no good, baby. Junk is no good, baby. Junk is good? No, baby. Junk is, baby? No good. Junk is no very good. Junk is good, baby? No. Junk is baby good? No. Baby is no good. Junk. Baby is good, no junk. Baby is junk, no good. Baby is no junk, good. Baby is good, junk, no. Baby is junk, good, no. Is no good, baby, junk. Is no baby junk, good. Is no junk, baby, good. Is no good, junk, baby. Is no baby good junk? Is no junk good baby? Is good baby? No junk. Is good? No junk baby. Is good junk? No baby. Is good baby? Junk no. Is good no baby junk? Is good junk baby? No. No good baby is junk. No good is baby junk. No good junk is baby. No good baby junk is. No good is junk baby. No good junk baby is. I was drawing a lot and I met this Greek who 
first view of the Surrealists, and he introduced me to them within the very first few months that I was at the Sorbonne. And I hardly ever went back to any classes after that, because they, they liked my drawings, and then I met their whole kind of group and everything. And, uh, it seemed just like a waste of time to go back to classes. Except that I had a scholarship or something, so I just had to go back at the end of term and get signatures. Well, that was very overwhelming, uh, very inclusive, in as much as they, uh, they were the dominant group in Paris at that moment and uh, had been the first, in a way, to turn an art movement into a, a terrorist political party and had uh, allied themselves with leftist politics on one hand and uh, the sort of haute couture world on the other. So they had a nice spread between you know, left-wing duchesses and, and uh, communist, communist millionaires <laughs> Trotskyist intellectuals. Um, they they had they, co they covered the scene in, in, the, in, the, in the 30s here, and uh, they were you know people who had left the movement for one reason or another because of sort of party politics. It was really definitely a, a terrorist party where you were supposed to think surrealist work surrealist, eat surrealist, and naturally, of course, dream surrealist. <laughs> <laughs> and it was run by an iron hand. What <laughs> was, was a tyrant. And uh, eventually lost his but the whole thing was a very dubious enterprise, I thought, even, even, even as I entered it. I thought it such a dubious enterprise that I was very quickly expelled for sedition, excommunicated in, in full flight. I, uh, in 1935, I uh, had been to Greece that summer and had come back with a series of very finished drawings, which I still have, unfortunately. And um, they had agreed to organize an exhibition of just drawings. And um, everybody in the group uh, participated. And, and that was the only time even that um, they had Picasso went along with them. It's the only time he ever exhibited with the Surreals who were naturally flirting with him like mad. Because they had lost Aragon and Zara, who had had left the party for one reason or another, expelled by Breton and power politics, and had all had become uh, members of the Communist Party. Uh, Picasso had not yet joined the Communist Party. Mm -hmm. I've forgotten when he did. I think it was, it was after, after the Spanish Civil War, the next year, 1936, that he joined the party. But uh, I still went on seeing Picasso. I went back to, to the Spanish Pavilion at World's Fair of that year, and saw him over the two or three weeks that he painted the famous Ganica, and mm -hmm. saw it in various stages as it changed it from one day to the other. Went home and furiously laid out more drawings, and then came back the next day and changed it. I saw it change right on the wall before the exhibition was open. I was excommunicated very brutally for a tender 19-year-old, in that I went thinking that something might be necessary to keep an eye on. I went early. The exhibition was to open at, say, at 6 o'clock in the evening. I thought, I think I'd better go there about 5. And I got there about 5, and I found Paul Eluard on hanging my pictures. And I said, what's this all about? He said, this orders from Breton. And very shortly after that, Valentin Hugo arrived. And she had been Breton's mistress at some period or another. But she, too, had been expelled from communicated from the movement and was on very bitter terms with Breton, so she took up my defense, which was at the same time rather embarrassing. Then, then there was no question about it. Then I really was out. And if I was being defended by Valentin Hugo, all I had to do was to go off with her. So I went off with her for a while. And some six or seven years ago, there was a, a dealer called Petit Torrie 
who had collected all that sort of stuff, and he had bought an entire her succession when she died. It must have been about 73 or 74, something like that. 74. And um, I read in the newspaper in Le Monde that about, there were letters were sold, and there were every name in the whole list was of very famous people except my own. So big painting is big business. Obviously, it's now become part of art history. And uh, trouble happened when people established museums of modern art. Now, in my youth, the only museum of modern art was a building in the Luxembourg Gardens where was stored the picture that had won the prize in 1870, the picture that had won the prize at the Salon in 1872, and that's all, and they were lined up like that, and that was modern art. The day that somebody invented a museum of modern art, well then art had to be modern every week, just like a department store, just like any other kind of, I mean, th then it becomes part of the rag trade. That's when it got closer to the rag trade, which has to come out in a new style every season. And the painters in the surrealist period were taken over by the dressmakers. In those days it was real haute couture, and they weren't doing, um, commercial stuff, they were doing these expensive things, but who was the, the sort of uh, arbiter of, of painters was Scaparelli, who hired them all, they did, Dali worked for her, on, on and on, the whole gang of them did things for, for fashion. For, so painting became linked with fashion through the rag trade. Hmm. Then the museum started up. There was only the one in New York, first of all, but then kind of whole schools of museumology were established, turning out, turning out um, a whole staff was, was being prepared in universities and everything. And so then rich people had to be persuaded to build these museums, and then they got, you know, museums of modern art. You had, you, you couldn't be, you couldn't be a, a culture center unless you had a museum of modern art in your town. And it, it created a whole network of uh, sort of international mafia of people like Pontus Holton over there who's a Swede and move, he's, where he's going to, he's probably going to move to Australia now from this is his next lap and other people come shuttling in and out. The French were very sort of nationalistic about it until now but that, that's all that's been broken. At least it just was a French thing and uh, you know, but they realized that they'd sit behind because it's now, it's, it's all become very, art has become terribly competitive. These are all sort of disturbing echoes, given the fact that the dream machine has such an exotic and such a long history already of troubled, troubled troubles, so that I just feel that they aren't over yet. And I would see the museum here, the Museum of Modern Art, the older one up there in the, where you were at the Biennale, uh, is very anxious to have a show in huge, great big rooms where Naturally, they want to see 20 of them sparkling away and twinkling away, and I would like to see 20 of them sparkling away on huge, great big pictures, which I would have done to the, pur to the purpose, but oh, that would mean I don't even have a place to make such pictures, I haven't got the money to put into the materials, I haven't got anybody who's necessarily going to buy them when they're done, and so it looks like a fuck-up to me right now. And yet, it, to get this project through was one of the sole reasons that I accepted, or well, I guess cowardice being the principal reason, but the other reason to get these things done that I ever accepted the horrible mutilation that they made me in the hospital for my cancer thing. Which I thought, you know, much better die or, you know, leave the room quietly or something. And Anthony at that time came galloping in and said, the name of the game is survival and you've got too many things that you haven't got finished naming a dozen. And of that half dozen at any rate, I have gotten quite a few accomplished, such as getting the third mine published, which still wasn't even was in possibilities at that time, a couple of others like that. But the dream machine is still a very outstanding responsibility. And the man who has made them has spent, certainly advanced, put out, God knows, more than $25,000, but he doesn't really seem to care whether he gets it back right away or not. And he isn't He's a very mysterious man who lives in a very mysterious sort of way. Carl Laszlo, he's quite well known, or, but his, his back is turned to Europe and to America. Like he's, he's a Hungarian and his 
what he really sees is back to German plays. In fact, the only machine that he sold, he sold to somebody who hadn't even seen one, but was delighted when he did see it as a big collector in Germany. Very charming cat. It was something like about $10,000. Like uh, 5,000 pounds, you know. And um, of course, what the museum paid over here, they paid that much for the one which is much less, just a prototype, really. In fact, it's a kind of homemade one that they've got over there. It's kind of, you know, fiddled away and put together with bits and pieces and kind of um, very much just a prototype. And they were very disturbed about owning it at all and very disturbed about showing it. Managed during a time that it was supposed to be on exhibit. It was fixed somehow or another so that it was almost always turned off and nobody could find the key to the place where the man who had the electric light switch was supposed to turn it on because it troubles them. And it began just the very minute they first put it together there and, and lit it up. There were three young technicians in there doing it. And this one cat, I said, you know, cl close your eyes. No, no, I said, I don't close my eyes in front of anything. I said, well, that's what it's, no, no, no. And then the other one, I said, no, he wouldn't know. And so the third one did and he said, oh. he said man, the whole museum is in here. <laughs> you should have seen the sort of look on everybody's face at that moment, because it's perfectly true. One of the first series of visions that you get are, are enormous, like unlimited acreage of Delaunay's and Vassarelli's and all of those kind of abstract painters. That's what you see, it's just that bit, like as if it were paint material. You see this great thing circling around you and developing and changing like that. And that, like, you know, like the process sort of mysteriously troubles some people. So the dream machine less, less mysteriously troubles them a lot. There are some unfortunate people who don't see anything, and they usually turn out to be art critics or art dealers. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, yeah, the problems of the art market are, are the problems of, of the whole second-hand trade. After all, what is a painting worth? It's a it's this boiled piece of canvas with some dried paint on it, let's say. You know, that's one definition of one kind of thing. And to, to make it valuable has a, there are a great many uh, elements involved which don't necessarily have to do with the quality of the painting. I mean, good painters like Vermeer can die in poverty and be lost for hundreds of years and come to the surface again. One must surmise that there have been others who never came to the surface again. Why did his come to the surface again is sort of just one branch of it. You know, where did they go, where were they sold, where were they resold, and so on like that. For a living painter, it's a question of getting his work out and, and on the market and visible. And that is done by letting yourself be completely robbed by a dealer. Mm -hmm. You give everything, but that's on the condition that you are at him every day, poking him in the ribs and make, showing him that it is to his own interest to, to get your stuff out there because he got it so cheap from you. But then, then, then the game goes at the cocktail parties and the who fuck school and all that, so that's that. But the basic fact is that if your work doesn't get out there, it's not on the market, it's not seen, it doesn't matter if it's in the museum, it's like I, my stuff is in all the pertinent museums, not in England, but in America and here in France, like that. But I don't have a dealer, so the situation I find myself in, partly from long absences from the, from the show spot. Right. Like, Paris est une fête, and New York is a party, and you're supposed to be at every one of those parties and be evident there for all the time, and be part of the show, because that's what you're... That's another role that the artist is playing as a kind of a mannequin, as an actor. And so he's got to be there, whether he's, you know, whether he's committing suicide every week in his loft downtown, or whether he's, you know, seen at the band douche at a costume party or something in Paris, or all of those things like that. Those are all. That that's true. That exists, but that's only normal for people who are out there as as professional. Uh, Showman, after all.
Brian Geisman. You don't owe poets a thing.